Well, thanks for being here. Uh, I'm Joel Farcou, and uh, I'm an assistant professor from the um, University of Paris 11. And I'm also the CTO of Metascale, which is our um, high performance company startup. Uh, the talk today will be about a library we developed um, as a core element of one of, our, of multiple of our uh, HPC and scientific company library, which is Boost Dispatch. And as it's the name says, is all about providing a way to do uh, funky stuff with stack dispatching um, to be able to, um, to have a very uh, easily extendable system for tag dispatching and uh, try to put tag dis dispatching in places that, uh, well, maybe it doesn't make any sense, but actually have a very nice um, uh, fallback in terms of uh, usability and uh, features. So what is about? Well, we are primarily dealing with generic programming in our uh, code source. And one of the uh, main um, features of generic programming that we try to uh, put forward is the fact that we can actually manage optimization through specialization. But the question is what to specialize and how to specialize them and how to try to, uh, well, how to avoid uh, what we call the quadratic problem of the tag dispatching, which is if you have an algorithm and P data structure, you will have somehow be forced to deal with something of n times p uh, version of your code. And that's what generic programming brings something new, which is concept, in which you will be able to gather uh, elements of your algorithm or of your st data structure, so you can actually factorize code in a very logical way. And that's very important for us, because in our cases, we have all those variations of algorithms, and we have all those variations of data structures, and because we like, you know, uh, earthing ourselves, we have all these variations of architectures we want to support. So we have an additional uh, dimension into this specialization mess. And uh, what we really want to have at some point was concept and concept-based overloading. Except, uh, last time I checked, we don't. So we tried to find a way to basically express this uh, potentially complex uh, web of specialization of function among uh, algorithms, data structures, and architectures in a way we can actually make sense and looks like uh, we can extend whatever function for whatever new architectures or new uh, data structure we need. So after a lot of um, experimentation, we ended up with something we call Boost Dispatch, which is basically um, a generic entry point for tag dispatching uh, we have that will provide you a way to actually define a complex hierarchy of types and properties of types that will more or less looks like uh, the old version of concepts. And uh, by having a way to basically specialize function with a, either a very fine or very coarse grain on types properties, or as we will see on function properties or algorithm properties, we will be able to factor code uh, in a very nice way that actually helped us uh, deliver a, a large number of architecture support in our tools. So um, I spoke about specialization, I spoke about uh, the tag dispatching. Um, we will spend a little time actually explaining all of the stuff it's supposed to, uh, to be, how they relate to the classical way of overloading function in C++, and what are the pros and cons of both techniques. So uh, how, how many of you are familiar with uh, Sphenae? Okay, <laughs> more than I expected. And with stack dispatching? Okay, so well, so the first part will be a bit boring. <laughs> And after that, we will see a bit what we wanted to do with Boost Dispatch, how the, uh, this generic hierarchy system is built, and how we can actually provide some kind of generic functor that will rely on these generic dispatching systems to send your function where you want them to be. Uh, we will describe some of these unusual hierarchies we put inside and how they helped us actually get something cool out of all of this. So, yeah, function overload. Oh, yeah, sorry, disclaimer. So. There may be trust of Boost Proto in these talks. Uh, I try to maintain this uh, to a bearable level, so you should normally stay there and enjoy the talk without having to suffer too much brain damage. So, uh, function overload in C++ is actually one of the, mess of the most actually interesting features of the languages, uh, except it is bound to a set of rules which are a bit complex uh, the first time you try to make sense of them. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I try to actually explain whatever is going on in this process. So uh, 
if any of the actual guys that know this more than me thinks that I said something stupid, please, well, raise your hand and stop me and correct me. I said something stupid already? No. Ah, okay. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, come on. Sorry. I was there. So uh, what's the starting point of all of this? You have a set of function which has a name, and those functions with the same name could be applied on different types or set of types. And at some point in your program, you call this very function on some arguments that have some types. And the question is, as a compiler, which one of all of these functions with the same frigging name should I select and apply to the code you are currently trying to call? So basically, there is multiple steps to this uh, process. And we see that this multi-step process is actually giving us a lot of places to be, um, well, some will say uh, creative, and some other will say, um, well, uh, sorry? Evil. Evil, yeah. So basically, uh, what we want to be doing is build what they, which, which is called a novel load set, which will basically be a bag of all functions that may be actually the one you are looking for. And once this set is done, we will see that there is a process that will basically try to find the best match into this bag. And uh, two things can happen. Well, three actually. Either you don't think anything, and the compiler will complain that it cannot find your function. Or you will find multiples, and it will bitch because, well, since this code is ambiguous. Or if everything goes right, well, it will find one and, well, say nothing and go. Uh, to the next place. And uh, that's what happens for regular function, and there is a, s a small diagnostic for member function that we check for um, actual uh, uh, access permissions and stuff like this. So the question is, how do I build this overload set that I would call omega from now on, because overload set is a lot of character to type, and how, how can we define what we call the base candidate for this overload? So let's build omega. Well. I have my function f, and what I will do is find all first, first find all the non-template function called f I can find nearby, which means that in the current namespace and due to argument dependent lookup to into a set of namespace based on the namespace that are actually uh, housing the my, uh, my other arguments type. And after that, I will have all template functions with the same name on the template resolution has been done. And this, this set is actually acting like um, a lattice, which means it's, it's a set with a non, um, an incomplete ordering relationship in which we will prefer the non-template function over the template functions. So um, we have this ordering between non-template and template. Uh, we have this argument-dependent lookup stuff kicking in. And uh, ADL can be a mess in itself in the your process of finding which function we have to call. So I won't get much into these details, but well. And now, uh, the first place we can be crooky later on is that this template substitution um, has to be something that works. So the function can be dumped into the overload set. OK, so we have our overload set. Now what should we do with this? Well, we have to find the best viable function. And to do this, we will compute something called implicit conversion sequence for each of the arguments of the functions. And those conversion sequence are ranked with respect to one and the other. And we will try to find a function with the best, highest ranked uh, implicit conversion sequence for all of these arguments. And what we hope is that this ranking and this function, well, actually there is at least one function that provides something to uh, overload on. And if there is multiples, there we go. Uh, ambiguous stuff. So how do we actually walk through this stuff? Well, this is basically a list of uh, elements we have to go through. So the first kind of uh, ICS is what we call the standard conversion sequences that consists in this order of an exact match on the type. You have a function taking an int and you pass it an int. That's an, int an exact match. It could be a promotion from, for example, small integer to bigger integer, or conversions, an integer to a float, for example. And uh, if this fails, we will look at something called user-defined conversion sequence, which is basically one of a standard conversion sequence followed by a user-defined conversions, either by a K 
casting operator or um, um, a well-defined constructor, and then another potential standard conversion sequences. And we will rank the user-defined conversions with the relative rank of their second standard conversions. Okay, so how many people have their brain fried already? Come on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I actually ate up something like three or four, um, you know, uh, headache stuff when I was writing this slide. And the last stuff to consider is uh, ellipsis, con uh, ellipsis conversion sequence, which is basically you have a function defined with an ellipsis somewhere into his argument list. And this is always the last stuff we will try to match. And so once we have all this implicit conversion sequence set for every argument, we can find the best uh, variable functions. So here's some example just to, to get the things right. So there is three functions taking a, um, an end to double and a pointer to a cons car. And I call this f function with, a, with an integer, a double, a st uh, literal string, a float, and a character. And so the three first calls are basically exact match for each of these functions. And what happens for the other one? Well, float is convertible to double, okay, which is some kind of promotion. So we will go through this standard conversion sequence of promotion and find that f of double makes a good match for that. And for this one, for the car one, well, car can get upgraded to int, and we will select this one. And I looks like I didn't say anything wrong yet. So now let's dump a template function into this. So for the three first one, nothing changed. Why? Because we will prefer those non-template function to the template function. And for the other case, well, we will generate, we will have those function into my, our context and we will instantiate f with t replaced by float there. And this will be dumped into the overload set. And what happens is that we will get an exact match on this instantiation with t equal to float, which will be selected before, yes? Oh, no, no, that's f of t, of course. Okay. Yeah, that's good catch. Yeah, that's f of t, yeah. I'm, I'm crooked, but not that much. <laughs> okay, so substituting float to t create a void f float function to the set of overloads. And this will, one get, will get selected because of the exact match on the type. And the same will happen with a car one, where t will be substituted by car. And both of those will go to this stuff instead of going to the promoted version of uh, the last time. OK? Well, OK, so what can we do with all of this um, very complex system of who do where and go where? Well, there is an interesting function. I have a function called f that takes some types, which happens to be a container. I return the type, which is a, a type def, which is sitting there, which is called size type. And I return dot size on my container. Oh, yeah, we're missing a c over there. So I get some vector of double uh, setup, and I call f on v, no problem. And what happens if I call f on, on an integer? So your, your C++ developer sense are tingling, and you say, oh my god, type name of in size tip never exists. I will end up with a message larger than the constitution itself, and I will have a hard time debugging this. In fact, not that much. What you will end up with is like, OK, no matching function to call for f of int. So much for all these huge uh, error messages you are used to get when you are writing function templates. Well, so what happened? This is clearly a wrong code when, and this one too, but this one first, is clearly a wrong call if container is substituted by int. There is no internal type def called size tip inside int, okay? But instead of having a, a wall of errors telling me that there is no such type defined in int and blah, 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 and blah, 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 I just got that. So all happens as if the compiler say, OK, I will try to look at this if container is equal to int. And as I cannot make any sense of what you're writing with container substituted by int, I will just forget this function exists at all. And I will go and see what happened I can do with uh, the rest of the code. 
So what happened, in fact, in detail? So we, we are there trying to generate omega for a given functions. And we have those functions which are actually results of the substitution of template type into a template function. And if this substitution fails, okay, the function is removed from omega instead of generating an error. The compiler just say, okay, this stuff makes no sense. I don't even have to look at it. And I will just forget it. And I will go on on building my overload set. And at the end, well, if this overload set ends up to be non-empty and contain no ambiguity, I will, the compiler will carry on and forgot that at some point it tried to generate invalid code. So that's what is called substitution, um, Sfinae, which is substitution failure is not an error. So you can actually find a way to make template function generate invalid code at some place of their definition to remove them from the overload set. Mm -hmm. So the cool thing could, could be to say, OK, how can I make something that let me fail this substitution whenever I want in a controlled fashion? Well, we can write something like this, the good old enable if, that takes, which is simply a struct that takes a Boolean condition and some type, which by, def by default could be void. And uh, it's, not de it's just declared, and it's uh, specialized when the condition is true to just return the result type as an internal type type def. Not a lot of technology there. And you can write code like this one. So in place of the return type of the function, you will try to extract the type type def from enable if of something. So in the first case, let's say, no, well, let's check if the size of t is bigger than 2. Okay. And the other f, let's check, it's actually lower or equal to 2. So what happens if, if you try to call f on, let's say, a double? So the compiler sees those functions and try to substitute t with double. And uh, after substituting double there with success, it tries to compute this stuff. So size of double is clearly bigger than 2. So this condition evaluates to true, and we jump into this version of enable which happens to have a type defined, which is result. And in this case, this is a default result, which is void. And I end up with a function, which the substitution gives me void f of double. And in the other one, well, the size of double is clearly not lesser or equal to 2. So this goes into the undefined version of enable which doesn't have the type defined, and fail to substitute this and just remove this from the uh, overload set. Mm -hmm. If you call with, uh, an, an, let's say, a short stuff, we go the other way around, and you will end up selecting this one. So as long as we can actually put conditions there that could be evaluated at compile time and are actually uh, self-exclusive, we can actually select between variation of function based on an arbitrary static condition. But there is more. Let's look at this. So an if type is a structure that takes a type and another type called result, and just forward result through this type def. OK. And now what we want to be able to write is a meta function that takes any types. And if this type has an internal size type type def, we want to retrieve it. And if not, we just want to return some random types, let's say std size t. So we want these size type structures this way. We have our type t there and some type name enable with default value of void. And we specialize it by seeing that we can try to replace this default value by extracting the type from enable if tip type name t colon colon size type. And in this case, I just put this into my type there. So what happened? Well. There is a rule that says that if you call, let's say, size type of t, the compiler has a choice between getting this one with a default value or getting some specialization where the default value has been replaced by something else. And it will prefer the one where the type is actually computed mm -hmm. instead of s selecting the default one. So what happens if your type is, let's say, a vector or a list that has this type def? So this thing is, could be computed and will be passed to an if, and we will return a void there. Okay. So this is void, but this is a computed void. So the compiler will take this one, 
and just give you this. Now if you call size tip of int, obviously type name in size tip does not exist. So this stuff cannot be actually uh, substituted. So in the same way uh, that in uh, function return type, this stuff is cleared out by Sphenae, and we'll end up there with the default parameters, and we get size t. So that's a nice trick to actually have something to check on the existence of an internal type def into an arbitrary type. OK? Well, remember what I said about ellipsis operator, which is always the last guy to be invited to the party, OK? Well, actually, it's sometimes useful. So there is some code. What does it do? Beside giving it x. I think most of you. It's just the size of trick. Yeah, that's the size of trick, which actually re um, rely on this uh, rules on the ellipsis operator being the last guy to be uh, selected. So what happens? You pass a type t there, and inside your class you have two static. Uh, functions that doesn't even have a body. Okay. So the first one try to take as a parameter a pointer to a member of, of a class called C and uh, return a, a yes type, which is basically a car. And the other, the other one just has an ellipsis operator there and return a no type, which is basically two char in a struct. And what we do is that we will call this test function by forcing C to be equal to T and passing a new pointer to it. So what happened? Well, if t is actually a class or a struct, this is actually something that makes sense. OK? So you can actually say, OK, if t, let's say, is s the vector, I'm trying to get a pointer to an int s the vector star. OK? So this stuff exists. And I can, trans I can cast this 0 into a pointer to this, and I will get there. And I will get a yes type. If you pass, let's say, an int or a float or whatever, this, right, this stuff is actually something that does not exist. It's all ill-formed. You cannot have pointer to a member of something which is not a class. So this will get kicked out by Sphenae. And the only stuff that will remain is the one with the ellipsis that will get selected. So what happened? If you are actually have a class, yes. So this stuff will return something which is a yes type, which conveniently have a size of, of 1. And this will return a Boolean that will be equal to true. And if not, and we go through this guy and return this, which has obviously a size of, of let's say, 2 or more. And this will be evaluated to false. And this is basically the trick that gets used by I don't know how many type traits in the world. And as long as you can actually have this function capture something that we may fail through Sphenae when in the context you want it to fail, you have your discrimination system. OK, so uh, that's finite. But this has some limitation. Uh, first, in the case of function, all the condition must be non-overlapping. If not, you will lead to ambiguity. Which means that when you want to add a new condition to be true, and if it's not trivial that all the other are false when this one is true, you will have to edit all your condition to explicitly say, and not the new stuff. So when you have one, it's OK. When you have two, it's OK. And well, when, even when you have two, it starts to be cumbersome. And if you have more and more uh, condition to test, uh, you will end up with a, with a large condition that doesn't make any sense to look at. And the other problem is that the selection of the function, yes? Well, specifically, this is a problem because of refinement. Yeah. Also, uh, I hope that you're going to touch on that because I don't see it on the slide. On refinement? That's just the slide afterwards. Right. That's the next slide. Okay. okay. And so, so Dave say it's also a, it's mostly a problem when you want to refine uh, your your function by having something which is more and more um, precise, and you want to dispatch. And uh, the other problem is more than um, it's more compile time problem is that when you want to resolve Sphenae stuff, it has to basically try to ever to instantiate all your templates conditions. So the more condition you have, the more compile time you will hit. So uh, instead of doing Sphenae, we can do something else, which is called tag dispatching, which is based on the fact that you can actually categorize a family of type 
using some empty types which that build a class hierarchy in which you can actually add whatever number of new elements inside using inheritance to plug them into the points that make sense to. And we would just use the normal overloading rules uh, to select the best match between one of this um, category uh, class and the one you will have been uh, put into your function selection, which is basically a poor man's concept of overloading. So this is a classical example, um, which is the standard iterator. So we have multiple uh, types of standard iterator. You have the input iterator, you have bidirectional iterator, which happens to be input iterator, and you have random access um, iterator, which happens to be bidirectional. You have output iterator, backward iterator, forward iterator, and whatnot. And the way it is implemented is this one. So the input iterator is the top of the hierarchy. That's the type with the less uh, information about what you could do with. That's a less refined concept. Then bidirectional iterator has a bit more in its interface by refining what an input iterator could do. And so does for random access iterator, et cetera, et cetera. So now using those small empty tag, well, you can start saying, OK, I want to implement STD advance, OK? And what happens if I take an input iterator some distance, OK? And I, I have this detailed function taking this input iterator tag as a parameter. So if you have input iterator, what you will do is basically uh, just, well, uh, advance your pointer w until you, you get your distance done. Because you cannot do anything else with input iterator. You just have access to uh, increments. If you had bidirectional iterator, what you could actually do is check on which side of 0 your n is to see if you have to do plus plus or minus minus to advance the stuff. So it's basically the same function, but this one, these parameters is bidirectional iterator tag. And so on for the random access iterator when you just increment by the distance your iterator. And again, this is the same function with this random iterator random access iterator tag. And how those advance is actually written? Well, you would just take an iterator and a distance, and you will call this meta functions, well, this thread, which is called iterator threads. So we give you something called iterator category, which is actually the type of the tag that actually describe what kind of concept your iterator is currently modeling. So depending on the type of iterator you put, you put there, this stuff will return you one of the type we saw before. And you just call this advent dispatch function we just saw with all the arguments plus this category. So if you pass a random access iterator, what will happen is that this stuff will resolve to a random access iterator tag, we get passed there, and you will jump there automatically. And so on and so forth for all the others. One thing which is actually interesting is that you can actually add to these systems in a very incremental way. Let's, let's, let's make an experiment. Like, we live in a world when the only stuff we have is input iterator and bidirectional iterator. Okay, and we basically implement a random access iterator later on, but we don't give it a special tag. And we call advance. What will happen? Well, this fact will actually help us go there. Even if this function does not exist, we will try to find the next best one, which happens to be this one, corresponding to the class hierarchy. And so, it's like, you know, I don't know if you know these games, you know, where you, you put a, a small uh, coin or a small ball into a, a vertical uh, panel with holes inside, and the ball basically falls into the first hole it finds in the panel, and you get some prize. You know, you have that in, in a couple of places. And so basically it's the same one. By actually adding overloads of, of this function with specific tags among all the tags you have defined, you will basically punch hole into this types panel, and whenever you throw a type into it, it will fall into the first one that makes sense. Okay, I'm not that good at, you know, uh, metaphor. <laughs> so, this technique of, I mean, you take a type and you compute this category, hierarchy, whatever, that will give you information about how the type is supposed to behave in some um, uh, context. That's type dispatching. So, 
this actually has a lot of um, advantage next to uh, Sphina. First, you adding new category doesn't cost much. Okay? You can basically make this hierarchy of classes as big as you want. Well, you just have to be careful to use it when you need, when you need it. But it's basically something that doesn't cost anything more. Okay? And it's basically less costly in compile time because of this. You don't have to actually instantiate all of this. You just have to find the proper one. And, well, you can have an arbitrary meta function there that computes your category from whatever types you want. Okay. And so in our cases, well, we have those two libraries, so boost SIMD and, and NT2, which is both uh, want to get performance out of your hardware uh, and provide a lot of computing functions, mathematical function or function working on an arbitrary large uh, data set. And we wanted to be able to say, okay, um, I have this function that basically has two versions, one for any kind of integer and one for any kind of uh, floating point values. Uh, and this function has this implementation for the both case uh, as long as I'm on an x86 machine. And if I'm on a power PC machine, in fact, I have something more for, let's say, unseated car that I want to be able to specialize for. Because I know that in this case, on this architecture, I want to have this specialization. And so we first started using Sphina for that. OK, all integers, all floating point numbers, except for car. OK, fine. And we ended up with something like, OK, I have this function that takes three parameters. And depending on the fact that the two first has a size of less than eight, and the third one is something which is convertible to a bool, I want to go there. And uh, if the third one is a float, whatever the two first are, I want to go over there. And uh, well, the amount of code we were putting into the Sphenae condition started to be bigger than the actual computation code, which was a bit cumbersome. The other problem is that as we added the functions, compile time were getting better and better. Except NT2 has something like 560 something functions. They had basically get overloaded in more than 10 architectures. And whenever we started including one of this stuff, well, compile time was basically skyrocketing into multiple dozens of seconds, which was not very practical. So we wanted to find a way to do this in a better way. And so we started moving around attack dispatching. So we ended up with boost dispatch. So we wanted to have a generic entry point for tag dispatching, a single meta function that you pass it a type, give you a hierarchy we predefined somehow. And uh, we wanted to have a predefined set of hierarchy tags for whatever types we are using, classical types, arrays, fusion sequence, proto expression, iterators, and whatnot. And next to that, we wanted to have a way to categorize functions by their properties. Is this an elemental function? Is it a data parallel function? Is it an IO function? And so on. And we wanted to have a way to basically categorize architectures properties. And on top of that, what we wanted to have is a single uh, way to write, OK, here is your arguments, dispatch to whatever you should dispatch, and give me the result of this function. So the first element of this is the concept of a hierarchy. To be able to have all of this stuff working automatically, we define a hierarchy of some of it, uh, by a type that inherits basically from another hierarchy. And it has an internal type def called parent, which is basically equal to uh, the type it inherits from. And usually, those hierarchies are actually template structures that carries the types that are currently categorizing. And on the top of that, we add a hierarchy called unspecified, which is basically the least informative stuff you can have. You say, well, I don't know what you're giving to me, but if you want that, well, here it is. And so we can build hierarchies of stuff on top of that. And if I wanted to write this input iterator tags, bidirectional tag iterator, and so on, using our concepts, so we'd be looking like this. It's basically the same, except we have this um, type def inside that lets us access to the actual classes we inherit from. If anyone wants to know if I can do this without having the type def, I'm very uh, glad to know how, but I don't think we can. So we have this. And so, as they inherit from one and the others, it's basically behave like a normal category tag we saw earlier. 
except we have this additional information we can work with, and we have, ac we have access to the type we categorized. And this, we will see, it's actually useful for, um, for the your system. So we have a meta function called hierarchy of. You give a type, give you a hierarchy tag, done. And you can ex extend it either by specializing this meta function for your actual types, or if you need some stuff like uh, whatever the type, if it's a fusion type, or whatever the type, if it's a prototype, you can have a small sphenoid stuff into the, the class. Yes? So, what about the type that OK. So the question is, what about types modeling multiple concepts? Uh, currently, and that's the, the third point, in our view of the things, we never, have, we, we never had uh, the need for that. That's one limitation of the systems that we are currently working on. The problem with um, modeling multiple concepts is that we may end up having something like you know, multiple inheritance there, basically. And uh, well, the solution we are currently working on is could this stuff, instead of being a single type, be some kind of type list? And so we have to, to know where we want to go, and so on and so on. But currently, for simplicity, we didn't uh, use that. Yeah, OK. Cool. The other stuff we wanted to be able to do in another way is that sometimes you may have a type that should have some category in some context and some other in some other context. And what we maybe wanted to do is have an additional parameter to hierarchy of, which is basically a hierarchy domain that tells you how you want to categorize. Because sometimes your function wa want to know about fine grain information about your type, and sometimes you just want to know if it's a string or not. Stuff like this. So we are currently very strongly coupled to the way uh, NT2 are actually working, but something we try to address at some point. So how do we work uh, with that? Well, basically the same way we would have worked if you have written the tag dispatch in by hand. So let's say we have a function t that returns the inverse of t if it's a floating point value. Uh, if it's a signal integral value, we just return the uh, opposite. If, in, if not, you just return t. Well, so you have this. At the top, which is your main function, it takes t as parameters, and you just call this f underscore t with the hierarchy of t. And have those predefined uh, types there that would describe the property of your types. So, uh, well, you want some kind of uh, real uh, floating point numbers. That's what the, the real hierarchy is doing on. So if you pass float or double or long double or whatnot there, you will end up in these cases. This will get you any kind of signet integers. And this unspecified stuff will basically, OK, and whatever else, I want to go there. And, and done. And hierarchy off will take care of computing new these types. So there is a funky stuff into this hierarchy, which is this box called scalar. As I said, we use tag dispatching with boost dispatch in, in boost simd. And we wanted to have a way to discriminate between types that could be stored into a regular register and types that need to be stored into an SIMD register. So we have this box that we call a decorator. Oh, wait. That will help us have this additional information. So I don't know if anybody can actually read something on this mess, but that's basically the basic uh, latest of properties we are capturing automatically on regular types. So basically, you have all the basic types that have a hierarchy, which is basically what they are. So the basic hierarchy of, let's say, car is int 8 underscore of car. And from there, you will be able to go out of this. So we have the basic types, the basic types by size, the basic type by size and without type consideration, which means basically that um, real and integral of the same size go into the same block. Okay. And we discriminate in from unsigned int, unsigned type from signed types, real type from integral types, arithmetic types from Boolean types, and all of these are basically fundamental types. And unspecified is basically over there. So that's the basic stuff we automatically are able to, um, to um, hierarchize. There is a one odd stuff which is called real size which basically say, OK, I have a type which is basically the same size of any kind of uh, floating point numbers, which is actually useful when you have to deal with uh, bitwise tricks on, on this kind of thing. 
So we have these basic types hierarchies, which is built uh, one into the others. And if you write with the real fundamental types, those uh, hierarchy will be wrapped into this scalar stuff. And if it's not a normal type, you can define wrappers that will give you information about what is the kind of value you are actually uh, working with. So uh, Boost SIMD uses a SIMD wrapper, which is basically the same um, than this, but indicates that the value has to be stored into SIMD registers. And every wrapper, including scalars, goes into another wrapper, which is called generic, that encompass all the types, scalar or not, with some properties. And this is very useful in, uh, in the SIMD library because at some point when you start writing high-level functions, well, the 1 plus function, which is basically 1 plus x function, as soon as you have plus and a way to generate a constant 1 in SIMD or in scalar, the code is always x plus 1. So it doesn't want to duplicate the code between the scalar version and the SIMD version. We just have a dispatch to the generic version. And uh, we have other stuff. Well, we have a proxy wrapper that say, OK, this stuff behaves like that, but it's not a real type. So beware when you want to access this member or whatnot. And we were playing with some kind of VLIV wrappers that say, OK, this is a type, but you are working with a machine with a VLIV register site. There is also a kind of wrapper that will help you, well, grab the fact that you are working with a fusion sequence of something or an array of something with some size. And what happens with those wrappers is that, for example, if you have an array of four uh, floats, the hierarchy will be something like array of scalar of float, OK, four. <coughs> but that's the basic hierarchy. But you can have a function that says, I want an array of some number of elements as long as it's a real type, whatever float or double. So all these wrappers basically climb up the hierarchy of the basic types Okay, inside themselves before going to the unspecified cases. So you have a large amount of predefined function by just having to go up and up this way automatically. And of course, we were dealing with proto expression, so we had to find a way to get information about what kind of proto expression we are dealing with. So we have basically three um, wrappers for this. The first is Xfer, which is basically um, the most. Um, information for uh, hierarchy for prototypes, which is basically say, OK, I'm an expression that contains something there. And this is a tag of my expression, and this is my arity. And this stuff will basically act as this type there. So it means that if you have an expression containing something that acts as a float, it will go up to real type something, etc. arithmetic fundamental. And when we hit expression of unspecified of t, we go into node. And where we are into node, we will have the same climb up, but not on the basic type. <coughs> we will climb up the tag properties. I will go to this a bit later. But you will have a node of something plus two in some domain. This is a proto domain. Well, the next step is basically you have a node of something in an element wise function with <coughs> two parameters in the proto domain and so on and so on. I will go back on this um, function tag stuff a bit later. And when we are up to node of something unspecified and D, we go into IST of something domain, which is basically whatever proto IST in this domain. And so all of these are basically pre, pre um, archived by hierarchy of. So why, why did you want something more than just having information on the arguments? Uh, when we were writing our parallel code, uh, we basically ended up with the fact that, well, most of the parallel code can be expressed with a few number of recurring patterns, which is called parallel skeletons. And what is important when you have to port those parallel skeletons to a new architecture is the way you have to implement the whole family of functions and not every of them. And the question is, is those parallel skeletons basically cares about the fact that is my function data parallel? Is my function some kind of reduction? Or is it my function some sort of scan? And what we wanted to have is that, OK, I would just represent my function by some kind of type. And I will give information on this function tag about what the function is supposed to be doing. So we associate the type to its functions. And this tag is actually hierarchized using these systems. And so now we can extract information about the function directly from the tag. So this is the basic stuff. So you have your plus 
function which will be associated to the plus tag. N plus is basically an element-wise function. Okay. You will have to work on different elements. And so you have this element-wise hierarchy that goes into unspecified because it doesn't have any more information. And you have this funky reduction hierarchy. Reduction says this tag is a reduction, so I have to handle some kind of uh, n to one relationship at some point. And the reduction is defined by three stuff. Your neutral element of the operation, the binary operation you will have to do on each round of your reduction, and the, un the potential unary operation you will have to apply at the very end. And what's sum? Well, sum is a reduction called sum. That will use sum as its unary operation. I will go further on this a bit later. The binary operation associated to sum is plus, And the neutral element is 0. Why having so much information about reduction? Well, with this kind of stuff, both SIMDs basically have one function that handles all the intra-vector, register vectorial uh, reduction by just saying, OK, I have to move my element in my register in some number of ways, and every time I do this, I call the binary operator. And at the end, I add up with the neutral element, and I finish my operation. So whatever, this, whatever reduction we have, sum, prod, max, min, whatever, we have only one code for ending them on every kind of uh, actual operation. And for example, in OpenMP or MPI, this stuff is also used to be basically have a generic way of doing reduction with both of this uh, layer. And you just generate one function to, to handle all of your reduction functions. And scan do the same. Okay, scan is uh, basically what um, a, uh, you, you do a cumulative sum over your an array. So you will you will do a sum and, and work on on the dimension, and you have the same kind of information inside it. There is another um, there is another hierarchy that we use to say, okay, this function is actually a black box. I don't know anything about. Just call it and don't bother me with the details. So OK, so we are now able to dispatch on function properties, which we will see is actually quite cool. But what we wanted to do is to be able to actually generate the optimal code, or the so-called almost optimal code, depending on the architectures. Simple use case, you are on a machine, uh, you are on a processor that have some very funky intrinsic operations that you want to use because they go faster than any kind of manual operation you may want to write, you want to know that this stuff is actually there and dispatches a proper function. So we have to find a way to bring information about the architectures inside the dispatching system. Well, we just basically did the same thing that we did with uh, functions. We, de we define tags that represent elements in, in the processor architectures. And those stuff are, can be actually compound or hierarchical. And we will make so that the, dis the tag dispatching system would look at this somehow to know what kind of architecture you are on. And we will have a system that will basically build you the default architecture descriptor for your machine when you compile. So this is a small amount of the stuff we actually uh, um, um, managed to handle. So we have the full family of SIMD extension for x86. Uh, that get ranked by basically their uh, relationship in time. Okay. We have an OpenMP um, hierarchy that say, okay, I'm working on the machine with some calls and I use OpenMP as a backend, and whatever is inside those calls are described by this other hierarchy. And it's the same thing, we have this CUDA uh, hierarchy there. And everybody at some point, well, I'm missing SIMD there, but everybody's at some point going to CPU which is just say, OK, I have a machine, but I don't have any in, um, actual information about what's going on. Yes, Bryce? Yeah, yeah, this is CUDA, of course, yes. Yeah, this is CUDA. Okay. We actually have a GPU stuff which is above CUDA, and so we can have something that works equally the same on CUDA and OpenCL. But this should be CUDA, of course. And the, we have these funky architectures that we call formal that say, in fact, you are not doing any computation uh, with your processor. You are currently building some stuff that have, that have some sense uh, in the code, but not on the machine. And this is basically the hierarchy we, we use for saying, OK, I have this um, 
we have this product expression coming in and we want to rebuild it. And this rebuild should not uh, build whatever proto uh, is supposed to build when I combine this using my stuff. I will tell you how to combine them. And we doesn't want this to interfere with whatever other uh, specific functions that may take a proto expression as a parameters and do some actual computation with it. And so if your machine is basically a machine with a GPU using CUDA and uh, you have an OpenMP on, on top of AVX, your basic architecture type will be something like this. And this hierarchical um, nesting of architectures is basically mapping to the uh, hierarchical nature of the architectures themselves. So either this is given to you directly by the default architectures um, generator, or you can actually build it yourself. Okay. And so let's have a question. What's the difference with a, a GPU of OpenMP and an OpenMP of GPU? Well, GPU of OpenMP will do the following stuff. It will try, it will get some stuff to do, and we check if there is enough work to do to be worthwhile to go on the GPU. And if not, it will ask this guy to do the work for it. And it will take care of whatever details. Now, if you add an OpenMP of GPU of something, what will happen is that you will start some amount of OpenMP thread, and each one will run some code onto a different GPU. And so by playing on this kind of nesting, you can actually define whatever kind of architecture you want. You had a question, David? <laughs> OK. <laughs> so you can play with this. And I currently actually will try to have a small, uh, a small DSL that you can actually write stuff that looks like code and give you this type directly because, well, it's a bit cumbersome to write this for complex machine. And so, of course, we could have, for example, uh, uh, MPI hierarchy that we get on top of this and we get to the MPI stuff before getting inside and so on. So now, OK, I have this information about the type. I'm used to this. And I have this, this information about the function and about the architectures. All on earth am I supposed to call a function with all of this? So we have a function call, we have a meta function called dispatch call that we takes information about all of this and give you the actual implementation you need to call with your parameters. And either you use this, but we will see it's a bit um, complex to use, but it gives you the best compile time, or you can use a shortcut, which is a functor class that will basically take the tag of the function, compute the default architectures, or take the one you are giving to him and do whatever it needs to be done using a dispatch call and pass your arguments to the whatever implementation it found out. And this stuff is basically, well, a tier one compliant functor, uh, which currently is not, well, in C++11 you don't need that, but we, we needed it for um, backward compatibility. So let's write a plus function that get dispatched to do something. So either you can write this stuff using dispatch call, so I'm trying to dispatch a call to plus with these arguments, okay, and using the default architectures. So give me the type of this, and let me pass it the actual um, parameters to the, to the call side. Okay, so well, that's it. it's a bit verbose, okay. And so if you want to have something a bit less uh, complicated to write, you can just use functor. So I want to call the functor uh, represented by the tag plus using A and B and do whatever it needs to be done using the, hierarch the hierarchy of A, B, plus and whatever architectures I am currently on. Okay, so the question now is how do I specify those specialization? Okay, currently I have all those hierarchy stuff. I have all these systems to go through this and jump somewhere. How do I write the frigging code of this specialization? Well, let's say first you want to write plus for whatever couple of regular value. Oops. How to do this? Well, we will have a macro that will help you say, OK, there is a tag I want to dispatch for. This is the architectures. And whenever you match this set of patterns on the hierarchy, go there. Yes? OK, so the question is, what, is, what if we have an OpenMP instead of an OpenMP? Well, you will have something that generates a bunch of threads in which you will generate a bunch of threads. And if OpenMP is actually set up to have the nested mode on, it will work. And if not, it will do whatever OpenMP does when the nested mode is not on. So 
OK, so the question is, is all the nesting actually um, viable? Uh, no, but we basically know which, which kind of stuff makes no sense. And we have a static assert at this point. So we basically have a message saying, OK, guys, your architecture makes no sense. For example, a GPU of GPU of GPU of AVX doesn't make any sense. Your GPU doesn't have a GPU inside. Yeah, in the check compile time. Okay. And uh, just to, to go over this, uh, all of this stuff actually are part compile time and part runtime. Mm -hmm. For example, for the OpenMP stuff, every, um, every question about how many threads do I have and uh, what's the current OpenMP mod is checked inside at runtime. So it doesn't force the number of core or whatever at compile time. But we check that the architectures make some sense. So let's go back. So we have a macro that basically defines what is going on. And so how does this dispatch call stuff works? Well, every time you will use a macro to say, hey, this is a new specialization for my function on this subset of stuff, we will basically create a specialization of a function called dispatch that's like somewhere in an um, obscure namespace. And uh, dispatch call will take the hierarchy of the functor, of the architectures, and all the arguments, and call this dispatch stuff. Normal tag dispatching with, with occurs, and this stuff has a return time, which is actually the functor you want to call. And this stuff gets past your parameters. So we have this macro just because we have to do a lot of namespace tricks to get the stuff working where wherever it should be. So let's define our first plus overload. Well. Basically, if I want to call plus on whatever architectures and I get past two scalar elements on whatever properties I have, what I have to do is just, well, I'm just computing A plus B and the return type is whatever it is. So I think this is the most complicated way of writing A plus B currently, okay? And, and, and I know that. But, well, it gets interesting a bit. So now I'm in a machine and I have an ECC2 extension on it, and I want to be able to compute the plus between two vectors of double. OK, so I am calling a plus. My architecture is a ECC2 machine, and I have two double stuck into an SMD register of SCC family. In this case, I know that I can take two M128D parameters and call the whatever crops into a CQS call and get my result. Now, if I call my plus from before on, on regular scalar on, on this type, done. Dispatching is done, and I will jump where I need to be. What does this stuff do? Exactly. So th this stuff takes two fusion sequence. And using boost fusion uh, transform on, on in using the binary form of fusion transform, you will just recall functor plus on every element of A and B. So let's say our fusion sequence is actually a triple of a float, a char, and a double. Transform will just call that on each of the element. And each element being a regular type, so we will jump into the correct plus. So basically with this, we can do I mean, operation on whatever fusion sequence we want, as long as it makes sense for them to be there. That's the trick we use to actually uh, handle complex number in NT2. Complex number are adapted as a fusion sequence, and every operator except for the complex multiplication is basically handled by this kind of stuff, instead of having to rewrite everything. Which happens to be very interesting, because now if we want to support boost quaternion, we just have to uh, adapt them, and then we go through this. Except for the function doesn't make sense to be done element-wise. Yes? Oh, the macro there? OK, so the question is, what the heck is with going on with boost SMD there? OK, so this macro, well, the boost dispatch macro is called boost dispatch functor implementation. But it requires you to fully qualify everything into the correct namespace. So it should have been boost dispatch functor implementation, a boost SIMD tags plus, a, a boost SIMD tags arch CPU and whatnot. So this is just a wrap, wrapper macro that put everything, you know, uh, namespace-wise correctly. So, so this stuff is basically shorter to write. So it fits into the slides. <laughs> so, so yeah, now we can basically transform whatever fusion sequence using a plus function, and it's done. Okay, what is this thing doing? 
Okay, one, one, um, one int. This is basically boost returns, okay, which is the stuff with the auto return, you know, um, auto trading types, just a macro to simplify that. What, what this stuff does? So node is a proto expression hierarchy that say, I have a node which is a multiplies and has two children. And my all the side of my plus is whatever. But, well, but in this case, if I'm trying to do A times B plus something, well, I may know that it's actually better to call a function called FMA that may call the actual FMA intrinsics. So I would just restructure the proto tree by extracting the children of the multiply nodes and put them in the correct place into the FMA expression. And the FMA expression is later on optimized if the machine has actually the FMA intrinsics. So normally that's the point where Eric Nibbler raises his hand and says, why don't you use proto-transform for doing this? <laughs> yeah, two words, compile time. Well, and second word, uh, second stuff is extensibility. It was easier for us to have a set of functions defined like this in different parts of the code depending on the module the user were actually using and say, okay, guys, I'm, I'm doing this with an expression. Let's actually build that instead. And basically, this is something we, we hope disappear with Proto 11 because uh, as, Proto C++, as Proto in C++ doesn't have the generator stuff, we can do this properly using the, uh, the entry point for generating the expression stuff. But that's basically... Uh, a poor man's proto without a generator. There is a limitation on this is because you can only, re you can only uh, have, a, let's say, a, a one-step a one look ahead into the expression. Because there is no way you can actually write, I'm doing a plus with a node of something containing something else and again something else. And this is the case where proto grammar is still useful, when you need to match something on more than one level. Okay, so we can actually have stuff that basically re uh, reshuffle proto expression quite easily. And this is where the stuff starts to be um, interesting for us. So the macro changed name again because we want this time to work with the entity to namespace for, for the tags and whatnot. Transform is the main uh, entity to function that gets used when you have an expression of arrays containing only oper uh, element-wise operations. In this case, what you want to generate is a for loop from some place to another and, gen and just run the expression for each element of the arrays. Well, so if I transform something, on, we don't care about the architecture right now, I take two IST as parameters inside, the one I will write inside, and the, so that's the left-hand side of the uh, assignment operator, and this is the right-hand side, and this is a point into my array when I want to start the evaluation, and this is the number of elements I want to compute. Well, in this case, I don't do anything. I just make this loop, and I call this run function, which is basically something that triggers the evaluation of the tree. So I will compute the if element of my uh, right-hand side, and I will store it into the if element of my left-hand side. Classic stuff. OK, what if I want to? have a way to evaluate NT2 array expression using OpenMP? Well, just say it. I want to make a transform when I am on an OpenMP machine of something, same parameters. And in this case, what do I do? Well, I will prepare a functor based on transform on the inner side of these architectures. So I, I stripped the OpenMP information. I will compute how many blocks I have to compute per thread and whatnot. I just put this pragma open in parallel 4. I do loop over the threads. I compute where I should start my uh, computation and how many of which I should compute. And I call transform again. But this one, it will be on this non-open MP side, which basically we call this guy. So for each thread, I will call the sequential version of the computation on different slices of my arrays. Well, that's basically those 12 lines was all we needed to do to support OpenMP in NT2. Done. Do I have something else next to this? Oh, well. So, it all seems fine and dandy, and we were quite happy with this 
up to very recently. We started having users reporting insane compile time on code that doesn't make so much function calls. And by insane, I mean you're basically doing a matrix-matrix multiplication and the sum over that, and your code compiled in one minute and a half. What the heck? Isn't tag dispatching supposed to be faster than Sphenary and whatnot? Well, what happened? The exact same stuff that makes us able to do all this stuff quite easily it was also our demise. The problem is, let's go back, it is the fact that hierarchy are usually template types. The first example of tag dispatching I gave with the iterator, every tag was basically a concrete type with whatever, no template inside. So I won't go back to the first slide because I will get some, will hurt my hands, but remember, we want to build the set of the overload possible, the overload set of the possible function we may want to call. And if those stuff are as template stuff inside, I need to instantiate them. So the more hierarchy I was pumping into my function, the more template I had to instantiate before the actual tag dispatching was actually performed. So for a while, we were crying a lot, you know, because the old stuff was looking very cool, but lead to a large problem. And then, well, where is it? So tomorrow there is a talk. Um, I forgot his name, I'm sorry, but on this template profiler stuff. Go there, because this tool is wonderful. You're there. Okay, go to his talk tomorrow, okay? So we run our code base through this profiler. And we actually find out what I just told to you, okay? We got insane amount of templates and sensation. We made an extreme test case. We had 1,000 functions with 100 uh, overloads each using 100 types in the hierarchy. And in, on all of this, we were calling one function. So normally we should not pay more than calling one function and resolving it. Compile time for this, for this example was 90 seconds. 90 seconds for calling one function, something's wrong. And in fact, one stuff that saved us is a small change. So it's very recent, I didn't put it in the slide, but instead of dispatching using this function, and the first hierarchy being the tag hierarchy, when you are dispatching on the function f, you will call a dispatching function called dispatch f, which just, we just take care about the architectures and the parameters. And if this stuff fails, it will go into a generic dispatch function that we try to find something else. So basically what we are doing was slicing in a logarithmic way the number of tests we have to do for one function. So when we were calling f, instead of having to check for the millions overload we had, what, which one was the good one. We only had to check for the 100 ones. And compile time was down to 40 seconds. So it's still a lot, but because these millions of functions basically took a lot of pre-processing time, or with all the macro. But when we were looking at the um, reported time using, you know, uh, GCC time reports, NetLookup went from 50 seconds to one second and a half. So basically we were back to something that was usable. So now we make some other tests, and now we will get problems when we will have more than 10,000 overloads per function. Mm -hmm. But, well, if you are at this point of, of things, well, you have another problem than compile time. Something is wrong in your design, okay? But not by much. I mean, when we, we computed the number of actual dispatch functions we had in NT2, so we have something like roughly 22,000 something. 500 functions, roughly six to seven architectures each, and basically between three and 10 overload each. So it goes quite fast. But yeah, so we found this thanks to this template profiler. It was the best tool we ever had. So this is back to a, a new, um, something usable. We have works to do on how those macro actually works so they doesn't consume s too much time, but optimizing preprocessor is actually easier than trying to, to find template and uh things. So let's wrap everything up. So Tag dispatching, that's a cool thing. Do it. It's a good surrogate to concept overloading. Uh, I hope that maybe, I don't know, Andrew, end of year or whenever, I don't know, I could ditch all of this and use a template overload, uh, concept overloads in GCC. Uh, 
it's rather scalable compile time wise as long as you do it the normal way and uh, well you can actually use it in to do uh, a lot of funny things so we basically gave this tag dispatching stuff some steroids and uh, the main asset of the system is the fact that you can actually dispatch on properties for the function the property of the architecture is something which is very uh, dependent on the kind of code you write but it could be nice um, it's rather simple to extend either by adding new hierarchies or by actually adding new functions. One of the main uh, specifications we had when we, we, when we wrote NT2 was we wanted to be able to have different modules working on different architectures for different types and doing different things. And we wanted a way to say, if I put the modules, everything gets automatically picked up. And if not, well, I would just say that it never existed. And tag dispatching actually helped us doing this. Because, well, if the, if the hierarchy is there, it will get picked, and if not, well, we will try to do something else with the thing. So that's something which is actually uh, very useful when you try to make some kind of code modular or extensible this way. So we have a bit more work to do. Uh, if you really want to get headaches, uh, this current library has a subcomponent of Boost SIMD, which is self live still in uh, the NT2 uh, GitHub repository. Uh, if you want to test this on some non-numerical codes, we very welcome opinions, reports, and whatever. And we have a few remaining challenges. So this compute time improvement stuff, we really want to get back to something which is basically uh, far less. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, in to, to answer Dave, that we currently the hierarchy, the default hierarchy are very NT2 centric. You may not want to know that your type is a, uh, is an unsigned integer with eight bits in, in whatever you want to dispatch. So one way of doing, doing this is to have this kind of additional domain parameters that say, okay, use information from this domain to generate the default hierarchy. Uh, it works on basically almost all compilers, uh, except for XLC. Michael is not there. Okay, so don't don't tell that to him. Uh, yeah, we, we make XLC die in, in a fairy ball of fire. I don't know why, but well. <laughs> I suspect the Delco type is a problem. Yes? So the question. Oh, sorry. So the question is, are we really interested by the property of the type of the concepts that are act we are actually having be behind without knowing it? Uh, that's something we're actually trying to figure out properly. Uh, because, well, this has mo there are rather simple hierarchy I show there. But we had stuff like, oh, is your, is your expression something that contains a sparse matrix or is it a dense matrix? We have stuff like this that starts to, you know, pop up. And that really starts to look like a real concept. And what we may want to do at some point is basically find a way to, yeah, have some kind of, of way to say, okay, this is a family of concept I want to uh, hierarchize on, depending on this kind of threats or whatever. And uh, this code is a bit old, but the new code we are writing right now, it, it really looks like stuff like you, you have a concept requirement somewhere in the macro. So we, we may want to push uh, forward this way. So uh, the, the question is, uh, if concept were into the standard, will this stuff be obsolete? I hope that someone, at some point, I would say yes. I really want to be able to ditch all of this and, and do op concept overloading uh, properly. Because that's basically what we are doing there using, you know, I mean, uh, while, you know, we, we try to do concept overloading with something which is not made for this while, you know, be cycling on a unicycle. So it's very, you know, I mean, it's a very brittle system. It works. It do what we want right now because currently we don't have any more options. And we needed this kind of concept-based overload. Now we'll be very happy to ditch all of this and have beautiful chains of requires everywhere in my code. And I will completely do it. What we may be able to do is maybe have something that keeps us the way of actually defining um, 
specialization into distant functors because this helps a lot to have a modular code. So, but, but basically, instead of having this pure hierarchy stuff, we could have something that say, okay, the dispatch uh, node in the middle of the system is just the place where we have this all these requires that jump into the uh, actual uh, functor. So just replacing the your dispatch stuff by the requirement on concepts. And so we, we could have basically the same interface, except we, we have only one jump to the, uh, to the actual functor. So, uh, well, and if we want maybe have to, if people are willing to test and maybe find different use cases than us, uh, it would be nice. And uh, well, we may plan to submit this as a boost library when all this uh, improvement are done and to see if it actually still makes sense, okay? Um, in unless there is a compiler that go out with concepts next month, but I don't think so. So, well, here it is. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes? As I understand that uh, on concepts, we would use kind of search for that. So we can add in, or in, or negating um, this kind of can you, can you use it? So the question is, uh, we can apply some kind of logic on, on concept. Uh, can we do the same? Uh, yes, we can. Uh, we, have a, we have a small macro to say, OK, I want everything but that, okay, which basically puts the, puts the hierarchy into something that basically negates it. Uh, you, we found out that we don't use it much. And usually we, it's better done by saying, okay, here is the general cases and are the, the stuff we want to check. And uh, the general cases basically gather all the stuff that doesn't make sense. And there you can do whatever you want to say it's, it's an error or do something else. We, we barely use the, the negation of, uh, of, um, of, of, uh, of a hierarchy. What we do use a lot, well, not much but a bit, is to say uh, if any of my arguments are actually of this hierarchy, whatever the other one, which is a nice shortcut instead of having to say I have five arguments, the first is, the second is, the third is, the fourth is, the fifth is, or the two first, the two first, etc. This is a quite a nice um, shortcut for that. But the negation, we don't use it much. But I think that's a basic, I, I don't even think that uh, negating a concept makes sense. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if. Well, you just say MPI of whatever, and you don't put CUDA in the middle. For this kind of stuff, we have another decorator which is called try. And you can write stuff like MPI of try, CUDA something, and something else. And try, we try to call a function which is called um, evaluate that takes you whatever and the architectures, and we give you a, a score between 0 and 1 of the f indicating you the, the more close to 1 you are, uh, the best fitted to this architecture you are, and we preferably go to this kind of code instead of going to the others. So basically, you can have something like, okay, let's, let's see if I have enough uh, data and computation to start distributing them onto the nodes or not, and if not, I would just use whatever is on the node. So usually, we use this kind of decorator like, like this. But we don't, yeah, we we don't really use uh, negation. Okay, thanks. <laughs>